Many of you know I was in the hospital for five days at the end of November, beginning of December. I have good insurance, but I got a huge, I mean huge bill. There was no possible way that, that I could make the money for it. And, and I tried, I even tried to pay and I applied for assistance. Nothing happened. I mean, absolutely nothing happened. I kept getting bills, kept getting bills, kept getting bills. One from the hospital, another one from the doctor. So I finished, I, I sent them a copy of my last year tax return. I sent them copies of my little part-time jobs pay stubs. It goes all the way up till March and I still hadn't heard anything. So I called the hospital accounting. Oh yeah, we got them. We just hadn't got them entered in yet. Okay. And then I got another letter saying, well, this is not sufficient. You need more updated stuff. I said, you had it already. And so I just said, I'm done. Whatever happens, happens. Just last week, I got a letter, health partners. <laughs> it was dated May the 2nd. It said, um, we have given you a 95% discount on your doctor bills. The hospital is still pitting. My bill is $9, and it was hundreds before. So the lady I talked to about it, said, well, I need to transfer you over to the hospital county. They may be in the same building. I mean, they may sit next door to one another. I don't know. So I talked to the lady at the hospital. Yeah, it looks like we've got all the information we need. I don't know where it came from because they were saying it was insufficient what I'd done. And they said, yeah, it's going to be a really big discount, but we have different criteria. So I'm waiting on a letter from them to see how big the discount is. So. God is good, and he'll take care of you, put it in his hands, and forget about it. It's, it's that simple. Just do that. Don't let it worry you, because I quit. I mean, I literally stopped thinking about it altogether. And then all of a sudden, the blessing fell down, and it was greater than I could have even asked for to begin with. I would have never asked him for that kind of discount. He did. And he did it on my behalf. I went into the tax place down here on Plato, property tax for Ramsey County. I didn't have anything to pay the property tax. I'd never had that happen before. Went in and uh, talked to the lady, long line, got through real quick, and it was the day before they were due. So there was a lot of people standing in there to pay their taxes. People were grumbling, but I was in there a total of 12 minutes. And I told the lady, I said, I don't know what to do. I don't have money to pay this half of the property tax. What can we do? Can we make payments, whatever? She wrote a little notepad out, stuck it to a thing. She said, you have until the 14th of October with no penalty, bring it back with this page just done my taxes and it comes out $200 more than what the payment is. What, I mean, what can you say about something like that except praise the Lord? If you walk with Him and you keep your eyes focused on Him and not all this garbage that's going on out here around you, you can walk a straight path and not have to worry about that. That stuff just falls away. Falls away. We are so blessed when we walk with Him. Everything is provided long before you even get to that point you need it. I see that picture in my head. The blessings are set. They're set just like a duck's in a row. They're set. And as I get to them, 
if I obey what he says, when I get to him, I'll pick those blessings up one by one by one. And it, it's a picture in my head. I see him. It's just like yesterday in prayer meeting when Kathy was talking about that hip. I see that scar tissue that's pinching that nerve. I know what it is. She don't, I don't know anything other than to pray for it. That's enough. That's enough, and it'll be taken care of. One, one other short thing. I work, um, and I'm increasingly getting more hours. I just picked up Sunday afternoons in a memory care unit. I drive the bus for them. I take care of them on Saturday afternoon. I'm, I'm, my title is Life Engagement Coach. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I like that. Life Engagement Coach. I drive the bus for them, and on Saturday afternoons, I, I just stay with them and keep them busy. And one of the first things my boss asked me to do was devotionals for them, and they've never done that in that place before. So every Saturday, I get a table full of people and we go to the Word in the Lord and we get, we get done. I mean, and I thought they was asleep the first couple of times I've done it because they were sitting with their heads, but they were sitting in reverence. And that was special. That touched my heart when I realized what was going on. They were just sitting there in reverence just to hear the Word of God. And I would get through and they just, and these people have no memory. You understand what I'm talking about here. They are in memory care. They break out singing spontaneously. And, and it's perfect. They got the words down perfect. I mean, it just knocks me out every time that happens. And God did this. He did this for me. When I started looking for a job like last September or whatever it was, none of that was in what I thought I should be doing. But he put me in a place where I minister to, in that one building alone, it's like 120 people. And he's got me in an adult daycare two days a week. And, and all of these people were in need of knowing who Jesus is. And I, I'm just so humbled and, and amazed every time I think of it, what he's done. And there's nothing special about me, nothing different about me and, or any of that, but, but it is the one that I serve. That's, that's the whole key. The one that we serve can order your steps if you will let him. And, and I think that draws me to the scriptures that I have today. Oh, there is a light up here. I forgot about that. <laughs> I can see uh, we're going to begin in 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 1, but that's not where that thing goes. But we'll, we'll pray first. Lord God Almighty, we thank and praise you for what you're doing for us and the work that you're doing in and through our lives. And we ask, Lord, on, on this day, on, on this moment in history and in time, that each and every person that's sitting out here in front of me, you have something for them, and I know you do. I don't have all the words, Lord. You do it. You, you supply me with the words. But I want to see each and every person sitting out here touched. Even the people walking by that sidewalk out there, Lord, touched them. Even bring them in. If there's somebody on this street out here today, Lord, that, that needs to know you, bring them in here today and help us to show them who you are. We thank and praise you for it, Lord, and we certainly give all the praise and honor and glory to you today. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. I'm going to read a little bit before I start. Probably not as much as I think, but he's in charge. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. In the very ancient uh, manuscripts, 
Simon Peter's not there. It's it's the um, Hebraic name. It's Simeon. That's that's what this reads. Simeon, a bond servant of the apostle Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Our faith is not our own. It's faith of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's, that's astounding. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. I think it's very important, you know, I, I, this never even crossed my mind till this morning. At 8.05 this morning, I was still dripping from the shower. I got a call from Pastor Kim. You might need to be ready this morning, which he, he knows I'm ready. But being ready and being ready are two different things sometimes. <laughs> and I, I got to looking at things, and this is not what, even, what I even started looking at. I started looking at what I preached yesterday. This is something that just dropped on my heart this morning. And that, that, that's the first thing that really caught my attention. Knowledge of Him who called us, called us, talking about Jesus calling us by glory and virtue. What did that mean? What does that mean? That's the first thing that crosses my mind when I see something like this. What does that really mean? Well, we've all kind of got an idea what glory is, and we all think of that mostly as to do with heaven. We even call heaven glory land sometimes, or different phrases. I grew up down south, so we say things different down there than y'all do. You already know that. But we talk about glory land and, and crossing over into glory and something. And, but it's always something that's over there. It's, it's out there. It's like almost like it's something that's unreachable until after we pass this life. Well, I found out this morning it's not. I'll, I'll read you the definition of, of what glory really means. Glory. And the word is doxa. Doxa in Hebrew. Compared to doxology, paradox, heterodoxy, and orthodoxy. Originally, an opinion or estimation in which one is held. That puts it back to someone or an entity where someone is held in glory. Then the word came to denote the reputation good standing and esteem given to a person. It progressed to honor or glory given to peoples, nations, and individuals. And I got to thinking, well, I'm, I'm called by that. How, how, can, how can that be? Well, it is because Scripture says so. Number one, we don't argue with Scripture. If it says something, that's how it is. Period. And it clearly says that we are called, called us by glory and virtue. Glory, we know He is glorious. The very definition of glory is Him. So He called Him, called us by Himself. And the next one is virtue. And I'm thinking, wow, I have a different, 
idea of virtue. I said, There's, I'm, not, I'm not virtuous or by any stretch of the mean. So I looked down in my study Bible right here. Just about that far down, it tells me what virtue is. Virtue. Arieta. Used in classical Greek to describe any quality that elicited preeminent estimation of a person. Later, the word signified intrinsic value, moral excellence, and goodness. It is used both of God and persons. I just suddenly, after I looked at this and thought it over, and I hope you do too, I got a new opinion of myself. But that opinion in these words, the key to unlocking that door is Jesus. You can't have none of these things on your own. And absolutely none of these things will apply to you until you accept Jesus, until you know Him, until you walk with Him. And it goes further on in these scriptures to explain to us why. That is the most wonderful thing that I have discovered about scriptures. If you read it enough, it'll explain itself. All you got to do is stay at it. You can see this book. I've got the cover nearly wore off of it. And I hadn't had that that long. If you get in His Word and you stay in it and you keep your eyes on Him, all of these words and attributes that apply to Jesus applies to your life because you're just extruding what He put in here. That's what we're doing. And that's what our job is to reflect to the world what Jesus has put in us. That's what we do. That's what our job is, if you want to put it down like that. But there is nothing about serving Jesus that's job-like because it's 100% pleasure. And I've never done of any job of any kind that I could say was 100% pleasure. But serving Him is. By which... Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped, listen to this, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We can escape every bit of it. And instilled in it up in us is the exact same nature of Jesus. That's what these words are telling us right here. I, I just, do you believe that or not? That's the question. Can you even dare to believe that? Because he said it, I can believe it, and I can live it. In, in verse 5, it goes into a little bit different. It's called um, fruitful growth in the faith. Growth. I don't care if we're talking about butter bean plants, corn, anything. There's a growth to it all. A Christian life is exactly the same way. You don't start off the day you say yes to Jesus full grown. 
There was a lot of kids around. I was one of them. I was precocious, maybe. I thought I was grown when I was five. And we see a lot of kids like that now. Well, Christians can do the same thing. Don't step out of your place. Don't be acting grown when you're still sipping milk. You can start acting, start acting grown when you start eating a little meat. And Scripture bears that out. So don't be out here a baby Christian acting like you're grown because you're still needing that nourishment that's being poured in. And He does. Whenever we're a young Christian, He really pours it on us. I'm talking about hard. It's like He's turned the cup upside down on us. And He's pouring so much into us. But He knows how much you can handle. He knows how much you can handle. One of my main questions, I don't even remember how many years I've been going here now, 20 at least, I think. My main question almost every week to Pastor Kim, I, does this just keep getting better? I don't have to ask that anymore. I know it does. You just keep walking and walking. It gets better as you go. And it keeps getting better. And he keeps dumping things on him. As you get to where you can handle it, when we're start talking about the really deep stuff, he may not pour it as quick or as may not turn the cup completely over, but he gives you what you need. The bottom line point on that is trust him for everything you need. Even in the walk with him, you have to trust him and even order to take a step trust him and it will lead where he wants you to go but also verse 5 but also for this very reason giving all diligence add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge how do you get knowledge? Studying. Coming to Bible Institute. Praying. Praying with one another. If you really have a, a desire in your heart to know Him, get alone somewhere we used to call it going to your closet. That's what we called it down south. We go to our closet. We didn't really have a closet. Some places did. Homes had an empty closet and you literally went in there to pray. You shut the door. Now, whenever they talk about that in the Bible, they're talking about that shawl they wear and they pull it over their head. That shuts off the outside world. So really, you are in your prayer closet. And when you pray... Don't sit there and watch TV while you're praying. Turn the stuff off. That's part of the part that, that's, that's going to your closet. Turning your stuff off. Turn your phone off. Ain't nothing going to happen in the time that you're in prayer on that phone that he hadn't taken care of already anyhow. I don't care what kind of job you got. Don't let the phone be your Lord. Don't let the TV be your Lord. But if you leave it on when you're supposedly in your prayer closet, you're not really in there. You're still connected to the world. Whenever you want to unconnect from the world and connect with Him, you've got to cut the world off. And it's, it's as easy as shutting the door to your closet, so to speak. And... and that's the pictures I have in my head. And nothing, nothing can, can, people will try to interrupt you, especially children will try to interrupt you when you're in your prayer closet. Just don't allow that to happen. And you know the difference when you got a kid hollering for you, whether he's just hollering or whether he's really hurt. You know the difference when you hear that. I know the difference in the people that I deal with. And they're 
None of them could be considered children. But I know when they talk to me, whether it's something they're just having an episode or whether they're really in distress. I know the difference, but the only way I know that is because he does. And he translates that through my heart. Verse 6. To knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness. These are the attributes that God is commanding us. This is talking about a growing Christian here. These things are things we need to be added. I'm going to tell you right now, I have questions in my mind. Someone that wants to stand out and probably one of these five-year-olds is trying to act grown, telling us this and that, whatever they can think of. They say whatever they think somebody wants to hear. And they're good at it. But they're still, they're a little child sipping milk. They haven't added self-control, knowledge, virtue. Um... Perseverance and godliness to their character. We're talking about a character here. They're, you either have a Christian character or you don't. And when you first came to the Lord, just like everybody else, you didn't have a character. <laughs> you you might have had a reputation, but you didn't have a character. Don't get confused by reputation and character. Character is something that you build over your lifetime. And these things that I'm speaking of right now are the attributes to your life that God wants in there to make a godly character. It's, it's really simple. Verse 7, to godliness, brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness, love. I'm pretty much convinced that most people get kindness and niceness confused. There are not once in scriptures does it say anything about being nice. It always says kindness, and they are two different things. You can be kind to somebody when you're reading them their mail. When you are, when you get to the position where, where God has put some authority on you, and there's things going on that, that need correction, and, and you've gotten in a position, you, you've gained these attributes that. that you have been studying and um, gaining and storing away in your heart and your mind. And you can go to a brother and say, well, I see some things here that uh, it's just not quite fitting the Christian character here. And could be somebody that's just two weeks old. Could be somebody that's been in the church 15 years. Don't go out there and do that on your own. Do that in the Spirit. And there's even scriptures that gives you guidelines to do these things. It says that you go to them and you can take another brother with you. And if that won't, don't work, bring another one. And, and if they refuse to bring whatever is going on out there that ought not be. If they refuse, you can invite them to go do their study somewhere else, so to speak. And, and that is, that's biblical. That's a biblical way to handle problems. And thankfully, we're really all just such good Christians here. Don't nobody have any problems. So I'm just preaching to the choir here. So. But, but this is so you can tell somebody else. This is so you can tell somebody else. Well, 
Um, but that brotherly kindness, there's not even an apostrophe between that kindness and love. Do, do you see that in your scripture? Now at the end of brotherly kindness, there's a comma. And to brotherly kindness, love. But there's not a comma between those two. So brotherly kindness and love are so close together you can't even put a comma in there. Think about that for a minute. So kindness and love are the same thing. That's pretty, pretty astounding. And we, and we know, we all know the agape and uh, phileo and all of the other words in Greek that go for love. We got one, which is one of the reasons I think English is a pitiful language. Um, we got as simple as we could get. Well, fortunate for me, I didn't even pass English in school. <laughs> and, and I think about that now, that, that uh, I didn't even pass my own language in school. <laughs> that, I don't know what that says. Something changed somewhere, and I know what it was, Jesus. Verse 8 says, For if these things are yours, and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm, mm, mm. If you let these things abound in you, and that's, that's true, if you let them abound in you, you won't be found barren nor unfruitful. God made us to be fruitful. And the kind of fruitful is I'm talking about is multiplying Christians. Our number one ordained order Go forth and make disciples of the world. That's our ordained mission. Every single person that has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's your mission. And we do that in different ways. I've met Ponch a couple of times here lately. He does it a different way than anybody I know. But he's successful because you can't say anything about Ponch without saying he is full of that brotherly kindness and love. He, he is like a puppy. When, when he meets you, I mean, he just, I mean, he, he's kissed me on the mouth before. <laughs> and I know there was, there, but he kisses me every time he sees me. Most of the time I can get it where he catches my cheek. <laughs> but um, back when I first met him, I wasn't mature enough to handle that. But I got that way really quick. If you don't, you have a fight. I mean, <laughs> there's folks, and, and, and he wasn't as mature at that time either. I remember some things. But, but praise God, he, he made sure he was around people that, that were mature. He was adding to his character. He was adding to his godly character. That's what his desire was. And that's what our desire is. The word Christian means follower of Christ, uh, to be Christ-like. I know a lot of people that profess to be Christians and they don't have very much of these attributes I'm talking about. Well, you neither need to get those attributes or quit telling people you're Christian. You tell them you're trying to be a Christian, but I'm not doing real hard because I've been here 20 years and I'm still 
you know, I'm still cussing people out one minute and the next minute I'm saying a prayer. Come on. Get real, people. Verse 9. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. If we're out here living like one of these people I was just talking about, we have forgotten that God cleansed us. He washed us white as snow and He won't bring it up to you again. We have to keep that in the forefront of our mind that we have been forgiven. We are forgiven. I don't know about y'all. I do, but I just say that for dramatics. I don't know about y'all, but I wasn't perfect when I accepted Him. You wasn't either. I know the one that's perfect. I know the one that I am striving to be like. We have to really get on mission here. And I think that's the overriding theme of all the messages that we've been getting lately. This is just one that's stuck in there. Our overriding mission in life is to be more Christ-like. That's it. And we can't be Christ-like if we don't know who He is. And these Scriptures right here are the baby steps that we need to take to get there. You can't just get somewhere. I used to be an over-the-road trucker. I did that for 30 years. I have been everywhere. Literally. Even places that aren't on the map. I've been there. But if I got some place like from, from Maine to San Diego to go to, I've done that trip before. That's literally the longest trip you can make in the United States. You can't think about that as going from Maine to San Diego. You got to think about that going from Maine to Chicago, Chicago to Albuquerque, Albuquerque to um, wherever. You, that's just too big. That's too big to think about. Our Christian life is that way. There's no way that we can really honestly sit and think about my life from when I became a Christian until He comes back to call me home. We can't think of it that way. You can think about what is it today what is it today, Lord? When you go in your closet in the morning, ask Him. Ask Him sometime when you go in that closet, what can I do today? Not go in there, I need this bill paid, I need this, I need that. Stop asking Him for stuff. He's already promised you that He's going to provide what you need. If you ask Him, just ask Him, let it go. And then ask Him, what can I do today to be more like Jesus? And I promise you, He's going to show you. If you can't hear Him, He will show you. It's not a day that goes by in the work that I do today that I don't see something that needs to be done for these folks. I ask Him, how do I do that? I do that when I'm in the middle of the situation. He will throw it to you. Sometimes you get prepared for something that's going to happen over a period of time. Sometimes it just has to drop on you because it's an immediate, imminent need. Believe it or not, you're even prepared for that. Because He's made you prepared for it. Um, with all these 
Christian character building attributes that you have. <laughs> now we get to the verse that has the therefore in it. And, and, and this, these last two verses, and I am going to stop with these two verses because it's, this was way more than I had planned to say to begin with. So, so he may have even built my character a little bit with that. Verse 10 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. How cool would it be to never stumble? My scripture right here tells me if I will follow these instructions between verse 1 and 9, number 10 tells me if I do these things and I'm diligent, I will never stumble. You think God said that or do you think somebody just put that in there? God said it. God said it, it's true. God said it, you're capable of it because He has made you capable of it because you've been diligent and steadfast in obtaining these characters. Amen. It's wonderful. Verse 11, For so an entire... For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this just the way it popped in my head. <laughs> and forgive me. Um, don't be a half ass Christian. Don't, don't. <laughs> and um, I, don't, I don't think it's out of line to say that. Um, that's not what he called us to be. It goes, it goes to the verse in Revelation. I would rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm because if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. People gloss over that. That means He don't want you around Him. He will spit you up. He will, you will be like one of those ten virgins that come to the door too late. I don't know you. I don't know you. No, I, this this may not be exactly, and you can figure it out in your head. You haven't invested whatever effort you put into this point to be left out, to be spewed out. We haven't done to be left behind. And I don't mean to quote a Hal Lindsey book because I don't, uh, those are novels, guys. That's, that's not scripture, all right? Um, it, it's, it's not left behind. Um, Let's do what that, that says, and then we will have an abundant entrance into eternity with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That means you can't just sit and do nothing. I, I, I was taught when I was little that you didn't, you didn't have to do anything. He would do everything for you. Well, that's true, sort of. That's a little kid kind of true. 
we're talking about meat eater true here. We're not talking about sippy cup true. We're talking about meat eater true. You have to do your diligence. He expects you to learn who He is. He expects you to take on all these things that I said about the different attributes of character. They describe Him to a T. That's His character. That's His attributes. And that's what He wants you and me to be. He wants us to be Him. He wants us to treat the people that we associate with on a daily basis, even ones that we just have a chance encounter with. He wants us to treat them like He would. So that little bracelet that people run around with their, on their wrist for so long, I still see one once in a while. Most people that had them on had no clue what they were meant anyway. What would Jesus do? The next time you see somebody on the street, sometimes all you have to say is hi and it will open a floodgate of ministry for you to those people. Because those are divine appointments, folks, believe it or not. They are divine appointments. And when you have people that you know, your brothers and sisters, you see one hurting, what do you think Jesus would do? I know what he would do. He would walk up to them and put his arm around them and say, I got you. I got you. And that's exactly what he would do. He's shown us in his scripture what he would do. Even the people that have done him dirty and wrong, he does that too. <laughs> that part just, wow. If I could only love that much, well, I just proved to myself I can't. And I hope I did you too today. So we're, go we're going to close. And anybody, anybody needs prayer today? Anybody want to come up and, and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? This altar is open right here. It is open. I will... Hang out up here for a little while. But if you have a need, don't wait till the last person in the building leaves before you ask for it. Come, come. He is willing and ready to meet your need. So God bless each and every one of you and I pray that you have a wonderful week this week, that God heals your heart, heals your mind, heals your body this week. Make Him your number one purpose to get up in the morning. And don't forget to ask Him what I can do for you sometime. God bless you all.